Good morning. Today we're going to read from Job chapter 40, verses 1 through 10. And the Lord said to Job, Will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Let him who argues with God give an answer. Then Job answered the Lord, Behold, I am insignificant. How can I reply to you? I place my hand over my mouth. I have spoken once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I have nothing to add. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Now brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall inform me. Would you really annul my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Do you have an arm like God's? Can you thunder with a voice like his? Then adorn yourself with majesty and splendor, and clothe yourself with honor and glory. bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that you are a mighty God, that you would be mindful of us, Lord, and that even knowing that we would sin and after we sin, Lord, that you still sought after us enough passionately and um, lovingly and kindly enough that you're long-suffering and kind, that, that none should perish, but I'll turn to you, and that you knew it would cost the precious blood of Jesus Christ, your one and only Son. Father, we just thank you and praise you. We thank you that we have been adopted into your family, empowered by your spirit, Lord. So we pray today to give us the words that you have us to hear, Lord, to apply them to our lives, to write them on our hearts and and be directed by the spirit so that we produce fruits of the spirit in this world. And Lord, we just thank you and praise you that we have a security and a peace that surpasses all understanding to know that our sins are forgiven and that we will spend an eternity with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You got a title? Do you know what that is? It's not just deserts. It's just desserts. But it's not spelled like desserts. If you ask your kids or even ask some younger adults what just desserts means, what do they think they would say? Do you know, Alina? What does just desserts mean? See? Do you know what it means, guys? It means you get what's coming to you. And a lot of us think that way. In the scripture, Jesus talks about that coming up. Well, we do get what's coming to us if we don't accept God's loving offer of grace through the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus Christ. Because if we try to stand on any other ground, we will find that that day will come like a thief and where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So I had to look it up. I had to show Sherry. She goes, she's like, that's spelled wrong. You're, you're going you're gonna to do it wrong. That's not desserts. And I said, yeah, it is, because I looked it up first. That's the only reason I know. You could spell it the other way, but you'd be spelling it wrong. It means getting the punishment that one deserves. That involves justice. It involves a judge. It involves you paying the price for what you've done. Luke 13, verse 1 says, At the time some of those present told Jesus about Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. To this he replied, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? The reason I had Mark read Job at first is to give us some insight again. Who do we think we are? So many times we want to question God instead of thanking Him for His goodness and for His mercy, like Barry said, that we have eyesight, that we have hearing, that we can breathe, that we, oh, that in Him we move and and have our being. All because God loved us enough to create us and loved us enough to send His Son to die for our sins so that He could be with us, so we could be with Him forever, eternally, forgiven, but he has to bring about justice. And part of your nature wants justice. Don't you want justice for the wrongs that have been committed? But the thing is, is we live in a fallen world. And there are consequences to 
our sins, mine and yours, because there's none righteous, no, not one. We all know that, but boy, we like to point our finger and we like to judge even though Jesus tells us to judge not lest we be, des- be judged. If you get your just desserts, that means something bad is going to happen to you because of something bad that you've done. And we are all bad people. But you know what? Bad things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to all people because we live in this fallen world. It's a consequence of our sin and rebellion to God. I used to not realize it this way, but when, when God banished them from the garden and said, you know, lest they eat the fruit and, and live eternally, that was compassion of God. It wasn't a punishment so much. It wasn't, we, I don't want them to live eternally. It was, I don't want them to live in this fallen state eternally. That's how much God loves you. He doesn't want you to stay in your sin. He doesn't want you to die with the penalty of your sin. He wants all men to come to salvation. And there's only one name under heaven written among men whereby we must be saved. So why do we get this thought process in our mind? But we do that bad things happen to bad people. We think about it. And boy, when there's a catastrophe, you see preachers even preaching that. How unscriptural is that? We all deserve God's wrath, but those who believe in Jesus Christ will have that wrath taken from them, and they will be given eternal life. Do you think if you're really good, bad things are less likely to happen to you? That's unscriptural as well. Because Jesus said, if you follow him, you will suffer. He's known as the suffering servant. He gave up his life to save yours. So don't be surprised the more that you're good in a godly way because you're following after the Holy Spirit and living like Jesus in this world, that you will suffer. And that's contrary to a lot of the gospels that's taught nowadays, which are false gospels. Jesus said, in this world you will suffer. <clears throat> and if you think about it, this first incident that's mentioned in this scripture was because the people were worshiping. If they said, hey, let's skip church today. It's a pretty day. Let's go somewhere else. They wouldn't have been killed that day. But they were killed that day because they went to offer sacrifices to worship God. Not knowing at that point that Jesus would be the Passover lamb, they were offering their sacrifices, and Pilate gave the order to go kill them and mingled their blood in with the sacrifices. If simply they would have not worshipped that day, they would have lived to see another day. Where is God in these times? Does He not care? Is He really all-knowing? Is He in control or not? Does he have the power to stop these things? Maybe there is no God. Maybe God is not good at all. That's the things that come out. And if you ask any secular believing person, Gentile this world, whatever you want to call them, unbeliever, lost, whatever the terminology is, and even if you ask some Christians that, you're going to get some of these answers. But the biggest problem they're going to have is how can there be evil in this world if there's a loving God? How can a loving God let these evil things go on? Scripture tells us the only reason that He allows us to go on is that all men may be drawn to Him, even through suffering. And when you see something like this tragedy, which is the point that Jesus makes here, you better be thanking God that it did not happen to you. And you better live your life to give Him glory and honor, because just like the rich man that Jesus has already talked about, you don't know when God is going to require your life. You don't know how it's going to come. You don't know if the day that Jesus will return will come like a thief in the night. So you better be prepared. You better be living the life you better be living. And as Jesus goes on to say, you better repent. Because in your heart you do have judgmentalism. You do think of yourself a little bit more highly than you ought to. It's, it's natural. It's your human sinful nature. And when those things t- come, you have to, t- to bow to the, to the Father through the Son and pray for forgiveness. If someone does a horrific thing to your family like Pilate did to those people, don't you want justice? Of course you do. 
And it will come. And God even says to let him have that justice. Who are you to take out the justice? You're not supposed to let the sun go down on your anger with your brother. You're supposed to be known by your love. And that is something contrary to the, to the feelings that you're going to have naturally and the way things are in this world. The, the perfect thing that, that naturally you're going to want to think is, I want to get even. But instead you can learn to forgive because Christ Jesus forgave you. You should want justice, but isn't mercy much, much better? Wow, that God would forgive me of my sins by taking out His wrath on His one and only Son. Wow. So you can look at the hardships in this world and everything else and say, thank you, Father in heaven, for taking out the eternal wrath that I deserve on your Son so that I could have eternal life instead because I am forgiven, and not only forgiven, but a child of God. Romans 2, verses 1 through 5. You therefore have no excuse, you, you who pass judgment on one another, for one, on whatever grounds you judge the other, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. And we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, O oh man, pass judgment on others, yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you disregard the richness of His kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you to repentance. But because of your hard and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. We're in Luke's gospel now, and we've gone several weeks over chapter 11 and chapter 12 where Jesus warns them about their own righteousness, cleaning the outside but not cleaning the inside. He warns them about not being rich in this world. He, he tries to draw them to the point that he's saying right here, repent, all of you, repent of your sins. So what does repentance mean? What does it mean to repent? Re, re, repent is a verb. Repentance is a noun. We, we know that much from grammar. <laughs> but what does it mean to repent? You hear different, you, different definitions. It is a change of mind, but I can change my mind because I got spanked not to put my hand in the cookie jar anymore. That's not repentance. Repentance is a change of mind because I know what I did was wrong. It grieved my mother for, doing, for disobeying her, not because I ate a cookie, but because I disobeyed her. How much more does it grieve my heavenly Father to disobey Him, the one whose laws are to give us life, not to, to cause us problems? He is the one who created us, who knows, uh, knows everything about us, knows our, our inward parts and everything else. He formed us in our, in, in our mother's wombs. He knew our names before we were ever even, for our parents were ever even thought about. How much do you think it grieves him when you don't show thankfulness and love and instead grumble and complain and you're the one who sinned and deserved his wrath? Repentance is that proof that you've repented, you've changed your mind because you have a change of heart because it's not something that you've done again. It's something that God has done internally in you. Because you have believed that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the chosen one of God, who came to save people from their sins, and that you have a sin debt you cannot pay, and it grieves God, the only way that you can be saved is to accept Jesus Christ's loving sacrifice for you. You accept this free gift. You don't put it up on a shelf. You don't do anything. You accept it and you get a new heart and you get the Spirit of God indwelling you so that His words are written on your heart. So now your heart, your motivation for doing things has been changed because your mind changed about who Jesus is, your sin debt, that it changed your heart, and now you do things differently. You look at the world differently. You don't go out there and say, I'm in control of all things. This is my life. I'm going to live it anymore. You say, I am a created being who sinned against God and deserve, deserve His holy wrath, but instead I get amazing grace and eternal life 
and I'm going to live for the King of Kings. I'm going to follow after Jesus. I'm going to study His Word. I'm going to pray and seek fruits of the Spirit and gifts of the Spirit so that I can be like Christ in this world because I know that my life is not my own. It was bought with a price. And I know that more than worrying about the things of this world, I want to store up treasures in heaven. And I am concerned about my fellow man and their salvation. To the point as Paul says, I, if I could, I would give my salvation up to save them. That is such a burning desire to see them saved. And yet we cry out and say, oh Lord, I want my, my children saved, my grandchildren saved. We, we don't get to that part of much, much about our enemies, but sometimes we might. But do we really live that way? Is it our heart's desire that the gift that you were given, the grace of Jesus Christ, salvation in His name, that that drives and compels you because you're a new creation in Jesus Christ. That is true repentance. Now, is something along the way, babes in Christ or something? I don't know. That's for you to judge. All I know what Jesus said here, and He said, you will also likewise perish if you don't repent. So I have to sit here, I have to sit here myself and say, have I truly repented and am I showing those fruits, those works of repentance in my life? How much different does my life look than before I realized that and it changed my mind and it changed my heart? Am I still living the way the Gentiles live or am I living like Christ in this world? who called me out of this world, told me to deny myself, take up my cross and follow after Him and fish for men. Repent is the verb used eight times in Jesus' letters to the churches in Revelation. Eight times Jesus tells the different churches to repent of the way they are doing, to change direction, to change their thought process. These are people that are the church of Christ already in this world that are suffering and he tells them to repent. He knows their deeds. He knows what they're doing. He knows their heart and eight times he says repent. I'll give you some more examples of repent and repentance in Matthew 3 verse 1 and 2. In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now this is from Matthew's gospel not from Luke's gospel. Luke writes this orderly account so you know what you believe. But Matthew writes the same thing. The, the ministry of the John the Baptist was this. Repent. That was his ministry. To sum it all up in one word, what, what's my ministry been for 10 years or whatever, anything else, is what could you sum it up in one word? John the Baptist was repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's here because the King of Kings has indwelled the earth and He will suffer and die and be raised again to life and salvation will be done on the cross. The penalty of sin paid for. The power of sin taken away. The Spirit given freely to men enough to where they will prophesy and speak in tongues something that had never been heard of before that Jesus would say you have a heavenly Father in heaven that you can pray to and cry out Abba. A little later in Matthew chapter 3 Starting in verse 7, But when John saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to the place of baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit then in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe lies ready at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. If you repent, verb, you will have repentance, noun, and it will be shown by fruit production. That's what John the Baptist says. It's what Jesus is going to say here in a little bit. I realize that the thief on the cross didn't have time for fruit, for fruit to grow. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise, but you breathe and live. Are you showing fruit? Is your life different before? Do you have the fruits of the Spirit? If you don't know what they are, go to Galatians, even look, and there's much more than just that list that Paul gave. Do you judge? Do you let the sun go down on your, on your wrath, your anger? Has your anger been so much in your heart that you've committed murder, as Jesus says? 
Or do you love others because Christ loved you? Do you forgive others because you have been forgiven? Do you judge not because you won't be judged, but you will be told not guilty in that day because of your faith? In Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The same message as John the Baptist. Repent, change your mind so that your heart can be changed by something you can't do yourself, but by a spiritual act of God revealing Himself to you. And then prove it by the way you live. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 3, Jesus said, But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance, so that their lives will be changed, so that they live differently. And we'll give you some examples from Luke that he's used so far. In Luke chapter 3, verse 3, he went into all the region around the Jordan preaching the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. I'm talking about John the Baptist then again. And in verse 7, then John said to the crowd coming out to be baptized, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe lies ready at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown in the fire. Continuing, Luke has these words that Matthew doesn't. The crowd asked, What shall we do? John replied, Whoever has two tunics should share them, share with him who has none, and whoever has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, What should we do? Collect no more than you are authorized, he answered. Then some soldiers asked him, And what should we do? Three times you get people asking, What should we do? Because we know we have an obligation to this faith that we profess. If we repent, we have an obligation to live for the King of Kings instead of living for ourselves. Do not take money by force or false accusation. He said, Be content with your wages. The people were expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John could be the Christ. And Jesus tells us and told us so far in Luke already that we've learned to be expectantly awaiting His return as ready servants, dressed, no matter what hour it is, ready to serve the Master. <clears throat> John answered all of them, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, that fire which will show what your works are, which will purify you. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to, give the, to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The tree will be cut down. The chaff will be burned up. Whichever way you want to look at it. What are your fruits of repentance showing if you have truly repented? So I'll remind you again what repentance means. Try to sum it up in a good definition. A change of mind, especially in the terms of you were a sinner and the penalty of your sins. The consequences of grieving God. A change in direction. A turning away from a life of sin to a life lived for God and His glory. Sorrow and even restitution for sin. Your, your works of righteousness cannot save you, but they're proof that you have been saved. That you're trying to pay atonement for your sins not to save you because Jesus Christ has done it but that you feel guilty that's part of our legal system again if, if you've done a crime you pay, you pay the, the time and you pay restitution if you truly are sorry that you did that crime and the power of God to show in your life true repentative heart continuing on in Luke Luke chapter 5, verse 32, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance again. And Luke 10, verse 13 and 14, Woe to you, Chorazan, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment for you, because you haven't repented. You think your righteousness is okay. You think because you've gone to church. You think because you've made a profession of faith and said the sinner's prayer, but is there fruit in your life? Have you truly been changed? 
Luke 11, verse 32, the men of Nineveh will stand up in judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now one greater than he is here. No one lights a lamp and puts it in a cellar or under a basket. Instead, he sits it on a stand so those who enter can see the light. Jesus Christ clearly came as the light of the world to light a light in you that will burn brightly for others to see that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven to prove that you are a child of Christ because you love one another and do acts of loving kindness. What did repentance, what does it, or what did it mean to repent or repentance look like in the church? In Acts chapter 2, verse 36, Therefore let all Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and asked Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, everyone, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sin, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Do you know how the Holy Spirit is moving and guiding you? Do you see the fruits of the Holy Spirit in your life? Do you know the gifts that the Holy Spirit has given you to edify and build up the church? <clears throat> Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the Holy Spirit. This promise belongs to you and your children and to all who are far off. To all whom the Lord our God will call to himself. With many other words he testified and he urged them, Be saved from this corrupt generation. Do you look differently than your neighbors who aren't saved? Do you watch different things? Do you go different places? Do you live differently? Do you turn the other cheek? Do you lend without expecting to be paid back? Do you forgive because you're forgiven? I'm just repeating words of Jesus. In Acts chapter 3, verse 17, And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But in this way God has fulfilled what He foretold through all the prophets, saying that His Christ would suffer. Repent then, and turn back, so that your sins will be wiped away. That times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that He may send Jesus the Christ, whom has been appointed for you. Heaven must take him in until the time comes for the restoration of all things, which God announced long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. You must listen to him in everything that he tells you. Everyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from among his people. Do you understand this part about being cut off? Do you understand this part about eternal fire? Do you understand what it means to repent and show repentance? Repent and repentance is not not sinning anymore, which you're still going to do, but trying not to for fear of punishment. That's not repentance. <clears throat> it's not sorrow for getting caught for your sins. That's being sorry that you're caught. It's an inward change because you believed in Jesus Christ because God revealed to you who He is and you've been reborn by the Spirit of God, a new creation in Jesus Christ. And if that is genuine, if that is true, you will see the Holy Spirit working inside of you, making God's law clear to your mind and to your heart and to your being so that you live for Him rather than the flesh and you produce fruit in your life. And a day will come when God will bring justice and the time of His mercy is done. Will we you stand because the axe lies ready at the roots of the tree? Are you ready for that day? Acts chapter 17, verse 27. God intended that they would seek Him and perhaps reach out for Him and find Him. Though He is not far from each one of us, for in Him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are His offspring. Therefore, being offspring of God, we should not think that divine being is like gold or st silver or stone, an image formed of man's skill and imagination. Although God overlooked the ignorance of earlier times, He now commands all people everywhere to repent. For He has set a day when He will judge the world with justice by the man He has appointed. He has given proof of this 
to everyone by raising him from the dead. Hebrews 12, verse 14, Pursue peace with everyone as well as holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up to cause trouble or, and defile many. See to it that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his birthright. For you know that afterwards when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. He f could find no ground for repentance, though he sought the blessing with tears. If the Holy Spirit's crying out today to you for whatever reason, you still have an opportunity to repent. Because there might come a day when you don't. 2 Peter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness, slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth will be, and its works will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to conduct yourselves in holiness and godliness as you anticipate and haste the coming of the day of God. And when we read the scriptures before about John the Baptist and they were waiting for the day of the Messiah to come, how many years later, I mean many, many centuries had passed and they were still longingly returning, many, many centuries longing Jesus' coming. Many, many centuries have, have passed now. Are you longing for Jesus' return? If you ask most Christians, again, they don't want it to be today. And it's part of that reason is because they would live a little differently if it were today. Then repent. Live as if today was the day. As you anticipate and haste, hasten the coming of the day of God. When the heavens will be destroyed by fire and the elements will melt away in heat. But in keeping with God's promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and new earth where righteousness dwells. I won't chase this rabbit too far, but you can get out of that, those verses that if you're living like God in this world and drawing people to Him, that that day will come sooner and these troubles in this world will be over. We live in a sinful world and bad things happen, period. It was never God's intent. He does not wish for the, those things to happen. And these things, this sinful world, the sins that we do have consequences. I'll give you an example. Gravity. One of God's laws. If you're up on the roof and you slip and fall, hit the ground, you get hurt or get killed, right? It's a simple law of God. Did he intervene? Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. How many times do you know that he intervened or not? How many times did you almost slip but didn't? But then if you did slip and fall and break your leg, do you still thank him that, you, that you've got the rest of your faculties and everything else that you didn't break your noggin? Well, how do you react right off? Oh, that's a... Or do you thank God? Do you do the same thing with... Any other things that happen in your life, even those things that are bad? If Pilate came in today and mixed our blood with our Lord's Supper, would you thank Him, those that survived, and mourn those and comfort those? Would you realize that God is still in control and have a purpose? Why those things happen? They happen. Could God get, intervene? Sure. Does he intervene much in history? Look at scriptures, not much. And it's for a bigger calling than just the normal. So don't think your worries and troubles in your life are far greater than anybody else. There are worries and troubles in your life. And praise God that he hasn't taken his wrath and will not take his wrath out on you because of what Jesus Christ has done. Repent and live for him. We live in a fallen world. God is in control. He does care. He cared enough to send His one and only Son, Jesus Christ. And in, in these tragedies, besides comforting the everything, you can have an opportunity to tell people about the peace that you have. 
because you are a child of God. That's what Jesus does here. He uses it for, for a time to t draw people to him. <clears throat> Let's look at it. Luke 13, at that time, some of those present told Jesus about Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. To this, Jesus replied, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this faith? Fate? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you too will perish. Are those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam collapsed on them? Do you think that they were more sinful than the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you too will perish. Boy, that's not what I would have wanted to hear. <laughs> Whether I was searching for justification of my own self-righteousness or it was just a, a news flash. I mean, could you imagine on 9-11 if somebody said, oh, look at the news and, and, and you said to them, if you don't repent, you're going to die. They'd think you were the most inconsiderate person there was. But Jesus is really showing compassion here because he doesn't want them to perish. He knows their heart too. He knows that they're trying to justify themselves. This is what has already been going on in this passage. But this is a, today's tragedy, and Jesus' answer is, do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans? What that's saying right off to me is, I know that I look down on Galileans already because they're not as good as we are here in Jerusalem. I mean, that's what the Scripture's saying here, if you understand. It's not as bad as Samaritan, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but these Galileans, there's those hicks that live over there. They're not as sophisticated as us and everything. And they're probably a little ungodly, at least less than, than I am. There was a judgmentalism was, that was there. So Jesus d directly addressed that first and said, Do you think these Galileans were worse than any other Galileans? And now I've got to think in my mind, Am I thinking, well, I guess all Galileans are bad now? Or did I get the point and say I'm just as bad as any Galilean or anyone else? I mean, why do we have so much prejudice in this world? Do you think that they were more evil because they suffered this faith? No, I tell you. If you do not repent, but unless you repent, you too will perish. Bad things happen you might think you're safe, but bad things happen. Whether it's an evil thing committed by man or not, because we live in this fallen world, or a simple tragedy, either way. He's not talking about physical death here. He's talking about spiritual death. They've got to realize that because they realize that he's not talking about, oh, Pilate's just going to come and kill you. He's talking about eternal things. But then Jesus goes on to give his own example. Are those 18 who were killed at the Tower of Siloam when it collapsed on them? I don't know if Jesus knew about the first event or not. If it was so current, we don't know from the Scripture, but Jesus knew about this other, which is more of a natural disaster, maybe. We don't know the circumstances again. But if we take this horrific action over here that I've got to have justice on, but it's just natural action, either way I'm questioning, where was God in this? And Jesus doesn't answer that. Think about that. He doesn't, he doesn't say, oh, God was there or anything like that. He doesn't defend anything. He says, you better be ready to meet the judge. He's already established that there's a God in heaven. Creation has established that. Everything else, do you bow down and worship him? And the only way you're going to be pardoned is to realize who the Messiah is. I've already told you about Jonah and, and his message and how the Ninevites uh, repented. Are you going to repent? Do you think that they were more sinful than the others living in Jerusalem? So now he takes it to Jerusalem too. And he says, here's this act, whatever reason it is. Do you think it was because of their sin? Because if you think it was because of their sin, you better be watching out. You better have eyes in the back of your head. Because you are a sinner. And you all know that you are. Because you judge. Because you don't forgive. As simple as that let alone love. And the thing is, is so many of the crowd there and so many of the religious hypocrites, their heart was so hardened, they just got more hardened. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you too will perish. This was an interruption again to Jesus' message. They were trying to take the focus off. Whatever the reason was, we don't know again, but there was another interruption to, to His teaching. And Jesus is not unsympathetic here he just puts the point where it is 
unless you repent. I'll say it sympathetically so it sounds a little differently. You perish also. Don't you understand it? So then Jesus tells them a parable. We know the purpose of parables. We know it from Luke, and Luke loses a lot of parables from this point out. It's so that if you who are really listening get it and hear it, you'll apply it. If you who really aren't, it's going to just go hard in your heart even more, and you're going to be forever seeing but never perceiving, hearing but never understanding. So I ask you, do you hear and understand? And if you hear, O Israel, do you obey? Because it's the same word. So then Jesus told them the parable, this story that comes alongside to give further meaning. A man had a fig tree that was planted in his vineyard. He went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the keeper of the vineyard, look, for the past three years I've come to search for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Therefore cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone again this year until I dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine, but if not, then you can cut it down. This further teaching illustration, obvious that a man that has the fig tree is God. It's obvious, this is one of the simple parables, that Jesus is the hired hand that is in there to cultivate. Yes, we can apply it directly to Israel, and you can put all of that in there, but we want to apply it to our lives today. Why is there a fig tree in, in a vineyard? Well, that was commonplace, and it took time for a fig tree to grow, just like it does with other trees, for it to produce fruit. So God had already given Israel time to produce fruit. And now someone greater than Jonah was here that John the Baptist paved the way for, that uh, children would turn back to their fathers. He was bringing back unity and love, not, not judgmentalism and, and hypocrisy and, and hatred. There's a fig tree planted in the vineyard, signs of Israel. And Jesus had been in his public ministry now for three years, give or take three years. And he still doesn't find fruit in Israel, God's chosen nation. We go back and look time and time and time and time again. They were called to be a holy nation. Church, we are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Are we? <clears throat> there is a vineyard and there will be a celebration and there will be those who will not be a part of it who are not dressed and ready and serving. You've been given time. Was it three years, four years, five years? We don't know the time that was given before. But we know that Jesus is compassionate enough to tell God the Father, give it some more time. Because I don't want any of them to die in their sins. Justice and mercy, so perfect of any parable out there, that God the Father is ready to do justice and Jesus Christ is interceding to the Father, wait, I don't have that last lost sheep in the fold yet. We don't need to be taking up soil. We need to be producing fruit. What is the purpose again here? If there's not fruit production, cut it down. Jesus can't be any more clear. If there's no fruit, repent. you still got a little time. At least I think you do. You don't know when that tower is going to fall. You don't know when a tragedy is going to happen that is, that is brutal, everything else. But today, repent. Today is a day of salvation. If there's little fruit, repent. Jesus will dig around in the roots, get you out of those earthbound roots, and get you focused to heaven. It will give you the nourishment that you need from God's Word through prayer, through the Holy Spirit to bear fruit. This tree was given one more year to produce fruit. But where are you at in this story? How much more time do you have to produce fruit? There's only one place to be in this story. A tree that is producing fruit. Here's the dilemma that the people heard that day with Jesus. 
And it's the same dilemma that we've heard today. Am I going to let Jesus' words impact my heart? I've got to change my mind. I've got to deny myself. <laughs> Can't do it ever, otherwise. Live a life of self-denial. I've got to consider that I might have to suffer and do without. That I might have to pray that prayer that give us daily bread and be content with that. So that I can follow after Jesus. That I can produce fruit. That I can be kind and forgiving and long-suffering and meek and patient compassionate and not just in word but in deed am I going to live during the time of mercy and grace while I have it am I ready for the judgment to come because the axe is already at the base of the tree ready to spring tragedies come every day to everyone how are we going to look at them how are we going to use them how are we going to get through them are these tragedies going to draw us closer or take us away from God? There is a world out there questioning when the tragedies happen, whether there's a God, whether there's a God who cares. And they're looking at little Christians, those who are to be Christ-like Christians, for the answers. How does your life live? What is the, produ the fruit that you're producing? Those are tragedies that happen. We see tragedies all the time. But Jesus is telling them the biggest tragedy of all is to face God without forgiveness of your sins. Repent. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for Jesus' words. We thank you that he lovingly gave up heaven to come down and, and do your will, Father. Lord, we thank you that he was prayerfully dependent and spirit-led and empowered to live a life as a human being that was without sin so that he could lay down his life as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. Father, we look at this world and we look at the beauty of creation and everything, but we also look at this fallen world and realize that there needs to be light and that Jesus clearly came in this world as a light, Father that He came in this world to light this world for you. Father, we thank you and praise you for you are worthy of all glory and honor and praise. We thank you for what Jesus Christ has done. Forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Write your words on our heart, Lord. Change our mind. It's something we can't do ourselves. And Father, we give you complete control. We take on the yoke of Jesus because it is easy to bear. Father, we just thank you and praise you that Jesus Christ will return to rule and to reign, that he is King of all kings and Lord of all lords. We thank you for his intercession. We thank you for the intercession of the Holy Spirit. May we be people that bring you glory and honor. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> we'll do communion after you do it at the end.